Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the ResourceWorks Society, his website, ResourceWorks.com. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. The B.C. government has now taken a unique tack in their fight to prevent the Kinder Morgan pipeline from going through to the B.C. coast from Alberta. What is that tactic and what kind of reaction are you hearing about it? Well, they've decided that uh, in keeping with the promise they made in the recent British Columbia election, they would use every tool in their toolbox in government to fight against the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Now, the Kinder Morgan pipeline, for anyone who uh, is just hearing about it or, or want a little more information on it, it's about a $7 billion investment. It's being manufactured by Canadian union workers. They're building the pipe for it up in Saskatchewan right now. And uh, those are those are great jobs. But what they're manufacturing is a method of getting Canadian crude oil to new markets so that they can add about $20 a barrel in additional value. It comes back into Canada to pay for our roads and hospitals and things. And if we don't do that, we're going to get $20 less a barrel from our Canadian oil if we just continue to try to sell it to the states, which has got quite a bit of their own. So this is a, it's a really a project to manufacture a path to get our oil to a higher value market. And that's what Kinder Morgan's about. But the British Columbia government has, has decided it's against this. It doesn't want to see that added value. It doesn't want to see what it says are the, the risks that come from uh, building a corridor like this and there being some sort of catastrophic accident and, and they say that that's inevitable. Um, now, they're, they're now starting to refine, now that they're in office, how they're going to fight this investment and they are attaching uh, themselves to a strategy that has been evolved by some of these groups funded out of San Francisco by the Tides Foundation to uh, basically undermine Canadian energy sovereignty. They want to uh, try to prevent Canada from developing its market. Uh, they say it's because they want less environmental risk. There are others who say, well, wait a minute, that sounds a bit protectionist. Why Why are you Americans trying to stop Canada from having energy sovereignty? You're saying that it's okay for the states, but not for Canada. So um, British Columbia has decided to attach, to attach itself to, uh, to this strategy to use tools in its toolbox to, to fight the investment. And it's kind of interesting. They've chosen to look at lawsuits that have been started by First Nations that are advised by the San Francisco groups to to compel Ottawa to uh, prevent the pipeline from being built. And it looks as if the First Nations in British Columbia are being seen as one of the tools in the toolbox. And, you know, it's quite interesting. You talk to some of the First Nations and they're they're worried about problems like, hey, are there jobs for our people on our in our traditional territory, a lot of these territories are in rural areas. Uh, are there ways to get uh, energy to heat our homes? Are there ways to get away from what some of them call managing poverty into managing prosperity? And, uh, and for a lot of people, having the jobs from energy investments, from pipeline building, from all of the economic activity that comes from that is seen as actually a positive, not a negative. So, um, the bottom line is, I think there's still a little bit of work that the BC government needs to do before all the First Nations willingly are used as tools for their political strategy. What about the BC government getting a former justice involved in their fight against the Kinder Morgan pipeline? Um, well, I think uh, he's a former leader of the British Columbia NDP party. He goes back a long way, so he's clearly someone who's who's a very reliable supporter of uh, of that that group um he also over the years made his name with the 
uh, Mackenzie Valley uh, Pipeline Commission. It was a natural gas and very desirable form of energy uh, project to get Canadian natural gas to the far north, and it was subject to a commission. It's interesting the strategy there when you reflect on it. Uh, there was a project that was strongly supported by the Inuit. There, there were other First Nations that, or Aboriginal groups that did not support it. And, and Berger really made his name as, as a person who was involved in environmental law through this process, which led to that, that project uh, ultimately being rejected. But the interesting thing is that by the time that whole process finished, the economic incentive to build a thing had gone away anyways. And there's some concern that in BC we're seeing the same thing. You know, delay, 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 then hope that the decision makers, the, the people who want to make the investment, just simply shrug their shoulders and say, you know what, this is not going to happen. We've got other things to do. And everyone's got better things to do. You know, Kinder Morgan Company is not uh, obsessed with BC. They have probably, uh, as a large company, lots of opportunities in the world. They've decided to put a lot of time into BC to develop a project here. Uh, it's a project that's met with the favor of the federal government. I've looked at the project. I think it's a, it's a sound project. It's being safely done. They've met all the conditions. The, the federal liberal government approves of it. Let's build it. But, uh, but the, uh, the idea that suddenly we have to do over a bunch of the earlier processes is what the BC government is hoping it seems will will allow them to bring the project to a halt. Well, it was foot dragging really that killed the Petronas LNG project, wasn't it? Well, it's hard to say that absolutely definitively, but let's say we compare the processes for getting things approved in Texas versus in British Columbia. You know, if you go down there and say, look, we want to invest $34 billion in your country to build an LNG plant, I guarantee that you would have a yes by next Tuesday. In BC, it took three years to get to to uh, an approval by the federal government. It should have taken much less time. There were some delays in that, and you know, even after all these approvals, things are ready to go. There's still all of these threats of other litigation uh, to do something that would create so much benefit for Canada overall, for communities in the Northwest where they badly need jobs. You know, they've had big troubles in the fishery. We we're re reading just the last few days. The canning jobs have gone away, and what are the opportunities? So, you know, that place is just going to slowly depopulate if there's no new economic opportunities. Petronas was offering a big opportunity for that area. And so uh, speed, you know, had three years ago, Canada said, let's get it done and made it work, made sure everything was protected and it was done safely for the environment, and they could have done that. Um, I, I wonder whether there wouldn't have been a different outcome. Maybe we would have that thing even up and running by now. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, one of the things that always seems to happen with uh, divisive issues is that you have people uh, on both sides yelling at each other, nobody listening. How important is it to have constructive dialogue? Well, I agree, Jim. You know, so many of our unresolved problems come from the refusal to acknowledge that there's a legitimate, legitimate existence of another position. And you don't even have to agree with that position to acknowledge it. But a lot of the time, you know, that's not even acknowledged. And, and look at uh, the situation in the USA right now with these really extreme points of view. Where's the middle ground in that? We know there's lots of reasonable people out there who aren't, you know, out there polarized, but 
they they don't really have a voice. It seems like their voices have been just uh, drowned out by by the extremes. How do you overcome that? I, I think that's one of the challenges of our time. It's one thing I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on. So, what can people do, and are there any examples of it? Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I've been interested recently in the work of the founder of Facebook. You know, this is a, a tool. It's in pretty much everyone's life. My my dad, he's eighty seven. He's on Facebook. He loves it. And you know, it used to be, oh yeah, it's for young people. But now, older folks, all ages, are obviously into this. And Mark Zuckerberg's the founder. He's been touring the United States and talking to people. He's trying to grow his business. He's obviously got some, you know, business reason for for doing this. But what I think is interesting is that here's a guy who believes that his company needs to get into renewable energy 100% for all their operations, and he's he's directing his team to move towards that. And they're pursuing all these all these plans to use greater energy. Smart idea, you know. Hopefully, they can uh, deliver higher returns to their shareholders by doing that. That's a business reason for doing it, but it's also good for the environment and. He's gone to places, and here's what gets interesting, where they're not talking about renewable energy. They're talking about using traditional forms of energy more efficiently. He's gone to North Dakota, where crude oil, a lot of it comes from in the States, and he's talked to people. He's getting down there, and even though he he sees uh, a vision away from fossil, fossil fuels, he wants to know what people are thinking who are working on the rigs out there. And he just did a Facebook post recently a couple of weeks ago in July, July 19th, if you go into Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook news feed, you can find that post. You can read it for yourself. I'd say it's worth a read. He's been able to acknowledge the common values of people who maybe see things differently when it comes to the energy future. He's recognized that resource communities provide our society's stability today. And in Canada, we're missing that. You know, I think there's a lot of leaders who they're unable or maybe unwilling to recognize that oil and gas are important commodities. We rely on them on, on them in a big way. You know, in the last 10 years, we have exported from Canada 10, uh, one trillion dollars worth of traditional fossil fuel exports that have created so much value. And clearly we have to also develop our renewable energy, but that's our present day reality. And yet, there's lots of people I meet who are in government who don't want to go and find out how you do these types of energy safely, how you, how you extract gas safely, how you get oil produced safely. They won't go and talk to local people. They don't want to get the facts. It's polarized. So, you know, I'm thinking, we've been talking today, Jim, about the strategy the BC government is showing us on how it wants to fight a uh, desirable investment for a practical material that we all use every single day. We all use crude oil in some form every single day. Why not find a way to build a middle ground so it's not these polarized screaming matches all the time? One thing I haven't heard discussed is using gasoline in a fuel cell for cars. Well, you know, we're, we hear so much about the, the next big thing as being a revolution. We're going to, you know, throw out the old, bring in the new, and that's how we're going to change and improve things. But is it really that simple? And and when you say using gasoline in a fuel cell, that's interesting because it's taking something that's been a traditional proven solution that isn't perfect and evolving and adapting it to use it more efficiently in a cleaner way. You know, that's something we can actually do way easier right away than waiting for that miracle fix that seems to be our pop culture obsession that we always think there's that you know that magic wand solution that's going to revolutionize our behavior. You know, Reality is a little different than that, and and the infrastructure is uh, already there to provide gasoline. That's right, and you know you break down these fossil fuels. Really, they are their components are just. Uh, everyday elements that are around us in abundance. It is uh, not that difficult to envision, uh, you know, converting fossil fuels without creating environmental harm into useful fuels and byproducts. You know, the, the chemistry is there. You look at the things they do in, in labs right now. It is amazing. I was just reading about the uh, genetic engineering of strawberries, so that in the middle of winter you can go down and you get that same strawberry 
that you got back in June. Now, some will disagree on the taste factor, I agree, but if you can engineer that, you can engineer, I would think, some better uses and cleaner uses of, of uh, hydrocarbons. And also, too, when they argue against pipelines, the oil companies could ship that product by rail car, which is much more risky. Ooh, they are doing that, and that's a big growth area. In fact, it's guaranteed that's how all that move, all that oil that's going to move to market by pipeline or could, which is way safer, is going to move by rail instead. So, you know, the real thing is by protesting pipelines, two things will happen. Number one, there's greater environmental risk as a result, and secondly, Canada gets a much lower economic benefit as a result because we aren't bringing it to a wider market. But these two factors should be the reasons why uh, of, of not, not just a majority, but really everybody says we're going to build some pipelines because that's the way to do it. You know, it, uh, it seems to become polarized over uh, fact sets that have been shown, you know, pretty clearly by the experts who, who uh, inform our processes that uh, we could do this safely and beneficially. You know, if we if we lose this pipeline, what we're probably going to lose is the national framework on carbon, which has been put into place at uh, some high political cost, I think, federally, and is the mechanism by which we will start to answer that demand that we we have a cap on carbon, we manage our carbon emissions in a in a broad way across Canada, not just in BC and and a few other places that have already gotten into carbon pricing. So we're going to lose that. Um, that will be, for anyone who wants to uh, say, I can't wait to claim credit for killing a pipeline investment, they will also have to claim credit for killing Canada's carbon emissions policy. I don't think that's something you want to have as, as a, an accomplishment, because I think that's a negative for the environment. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Stuart Muir. Stuart, you've done some interesting calculations about how much energy Canadians use and how to compare it. Can you tell us some of those calculations? Well, yeah. I'm just interested because... The, the amount of energy we use on a daily basis, you know, is probably a lot greater than most of us realize. You think, okay, I use energy when I turn on the hot water and have a shower. Uh, I use energy when I jump in the car, turn the ignition on, drive somewhere. Otherwise, I don't use much energy. Well, in a sense, that's true. That's active use of energy that you're, you know, doing, uh, when you switch something on and that uses energy for sure. But, the fact is we use energy passively and in a in the sense that we consume things that had to be made with energy in all kinds of ways all day long every day 365 days a year and i wanted to figure out what does that equate to because when you ask an engineer they'll come back and say oh oh that's uh, 325 gigawatts of energy per capita in canada that's how much energy you you use now if i told you that's how much energy you used, Jim, what would you say to that? I don't give a gig. Yeah, I don't give, who knows what that means? What, what is a gigawatt? So I set to work, I got out my uh, magic pencil, it's a, a carbon-based uh, writing instrument uh, you sometimes see in use these days, and some paper, and uh, calculator, solar powered, of course, and, I, and I, I wanted to work this out. So I figure based on the data from the National Energy Board and some of the other people who compile this. That, uh, now, wait for it. I don't know if you're sitting down, Jim, but, but the average household in Canada uses energy every day that's equivalent to 
someone in that household eating one Nanaimo bar every 20 seconds. So, so there, there it is. That's how much energy we use. Day in, day out. So imagine your household, maybe there's two, three of you at home, four people, you've got a cat, four and a half, uh, you're, you're, you're consuming a Nanaimo bar's worth of energy every, every 20 seconds. Three Nanaimo bars a, a minute, maybe four thousand or close to five thousand Nanaimo bars a day. That represents the caloric value of all of those Nanaimo bars. Because one Nanaimo bar, that's about 200 calories. And when we do all the things we do in every life, everyday life, you know, when you go to Costco and you buy that uh, nice uh, clamshell of beautiful romaine lettuce trucked up from California, bring that home, you know, that's got some caloric value to it because the plastic had to be, be manufactured and shipped and the lettuce had to be grown and then driven to the market and Costco had to keep the lights on. You had to drive over to Costco and pull out your, your plastic credit card and you know, all that is energy. All the things we do in life are, are really energy that's stored up. Even a, you know, a beer can, it's got aluminum. That aluminum is really energy made into a metal. It, it had to be, you know, ore that was manufactured into aluminum with a whole bunch of energy put into it so you could get that beer can. So you can have all these things and you get to that figure of a Nanaimo bar every 20 seconds for your whole life. That's, that's how much we use in Canada. And it's a staggering amount of energy, isn't it? Well, yeah. And how often uh, do we count things in Nanaimo bars? Well, I would say not often. Probably as often as uh, grizzly bears made with polar bears. Which is happening, but not a lot so far. So far, yes. But it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, you know, this week we've had the grizzly bear hunt in British Columbia de declared uh, 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 finished. Um, it seems to be that there are some caveats to that, and there are you know, exceptions. But, but uh, that was uh, an interesting piece of news. Well, they said it's okay to hunt grizzlies for food, and I don't see a lot of grizzly steaks in the supermarket. But what I do see is now uh, a loophole for people who will go out and kill the bears to eat their gallbladders and their paws because they believe they have medicinal value. Does that not uh, destroy what used to be a ban on hunting bears for those specific parts? That's interesting. And, you know, I wonder why some of the hunters are are hunting you, you've got to wonder what the motivation is because it you don't just say hey it's saturday let's go hunt a grizzly it, it's a very expensive laborious thing you've got to be prepared you've got to go be committed to go out there and do that and it it uh it begs the question you know wh why i think for a lot of hunters it's not just the uh the hunt that they enjoy getting outdoors um what, whatever it, enjoyment it is that people derive from from uh, killing an animal uh there's something more to it i think they all want to have their trophy photographs, and maybe some of them want to have that bear skin hide in front of the fireplace at the uh, the fishing lodge in Montana. But the picture for most people, I'll bet, is is what they're going to share sooner than they're going to take a friend home and show them the bear head mounted on the wall. So the the idea that they aren't able to transport the sort of trophy parts of the animal that might uh, be a you know, disappointment for some, but there's probably others who uh, would be just as happy not have not to have to check that bear hide uh, back back onto their flight home to California when they're when they're done hunting in BC. If you just want a, a photo with the bear, how about getting that guide to get you near a bear? Use a telephoto lens so you get rid of the distance between you and the bear, and you can have a picture with a bear, and it looks like you're up close and personal. Well, there's always a green screen. You know, you just uh, shoot in front of the backdrop. I had one of those uh, in front of the Empire State Building. It looks like it's right behind me, but uh, it was a couple of miles away. But this would so, give some legitimacy, still get you outdoors. You still have the excitement of finding the bear, but not getting too close. And I can understand why the guide might be armed, just in case things go sideways. But you still have the outdoors experience, the, the photo with the, the animal. And what's more, because it's alive, other people get to have that experience. It is, and you know, as, as a as an urban issue, it's an easy one to see why it's a win. Uh, I think in some of the rural areas, especially in southeast BC, there's a lot of bears down there. 
and there's a growing number of people. I think one of the one of the things is that uh, you, you get the interface of of habitats of human habitat uh, and bear habitat, and you have other kinds of wildlife that are out there that are uh, attractive to eat tasty tasty morsels for grizzlies, um, be that uh, livestock or wild animals. Um, if you see an increase of the grizzly population, it seems logical to think that there would be an increase in, in bear encounters that inevitably will have to be managed. So whether that, that means that uh, people just have to be more careful when they're out hiking in, in areas with a lot of grizzlies or uh, the conservation officers maybe have to be more active in watching out for bears that are coming into the valley bottoms that, that might be uh, hungry. Well, there's some interesting things that we'll have to keep an eye on, Stuart. Yes, we will. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. My pleasure. And I'll uh, go out looking for that Nanaimo Bar powered <laughs> car. I'll bring you another one of those next week. What, what, do, what do you want to do it in? We can do it in nachos. What do you say? <laughs> I love nachos, so yeah. Okay, perfect. My I'll guess, work on it if there's time. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society, his website, resourceworks.com. If you have any questions for our show or our guests, you can email us at housestreet.com. Like, how many Nanaimo bars will I need to power my house? I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.